I greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus. It's such a joy and a privilege to stand before you today and share this word of God with you. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been dealing with the book of Judges and we were introduced to the apostolic prophetic mantle in the life of Deborah, one of the greatest judges in, in the book, in the Bible. And today we're just going to unpack a little bit more about what is this apostolic prophetic mantle. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, we're going to be looking at one of the most famous prophecies in the Bible. Uh, Ezekiel lived in Babylon at the time of the destruction of the temple. Um, he's a very unique prophet in that he developed a doctrine of personal responsibility for right and wrong. And you'll find that locked in this vision, the valley of dry bones and the two sticks becoming one, is that personal responsibility. So this is one of the most famous allegorical visions in the Bible. And it has a literal context that points to the Jews that were separated and spread out in, in bondage. But it also has a prophetic context that we can apply to the church today. Now you've already, you already know, and it has already been taught, uh, the interpretation of this, of this chapter, that it's the resurrection of the nation of Israel. And for us, that it's the restoration of the church and the raising up of the army of the Lord. Um, the bones represent the Israelites that were in exile. They point to a church that's in bondage and captivity of the Middle Ages, and also point to the whole of creation that is in captivity in bondage and corruption. You've learned the perspective of the bones representing the structure of the body being resurrected from a graveyard. Um, but today I want to focus more on the second part of this vision. And, and that is what happens after the army of God is resurrected. People look at the church today and they see it as something that is insipid. Uh, they judge the Christians. Um, they judge Christianity and, and our faith by Christians that fail to overcome sin on a daily basis. Uh, but we have to believe that there is a church that is emerging on the earth that will be perfected. And we must identify it and we need to run into it. Judah started out as, as weak and as, um, as a failure, as one that is full of sin, as one that couldn't be a brother's keeper. But he was transformed through repentance and through obedience and sacrifice into the lion, into the lion of Judah. It's the same with, uh, with Joseph, the same with Moses, the same with David. All of these men, they started out as, uh, as children um, that were full of sin and made mistakes. But in time, in, in learned obedience, in learned sacrifice, they came to the perfection because the perfection was the Christ that was inside of them. So those that were connected to these fathers, those that were connected to Joseph, to, uh, to David, to Moses, they were saved. So we don't look at the outside. We look at the grace that is being developed inside of this, inside of this man because that grace becomes the mantle. So we need to check our connection. We need to check our location. So let's go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Now just imagine this. Here is this man. I don't know what he's doing. He's walking one day. He's in prayer. His heart is in tune with the Lord. And then suddenly something happens. And he's pulled out of this natural realm. And he's put into something that is supernatural. So the hand... It symbolizes the power, the authority, and the ministry of God. Uh, upon gives us the sense of something that is descending. So the hand came upon me. So the power, the authority, and the ministry of God came upon me. And it says that he, had, he was taken out. It brought me out. So it's talking about breaking forth. So he, the hand of God, the, the, the power and the authority of God came over him. 
it, it descended over him and it pulled him out of what is in the natural and it, it had to break out. It, so it's, it's a bit of a struggle getting into this location, to break out of this location. So <clears throat> we see what happens is that Ezekiel breaks out from the natural into the supernatural and God brings him into this location known as the valley. So this is the workings of God. This is done by his power, his authority, his uh, ministry to this nation. So God is bringing him into this valley and this valley is filled with bones. <clears throat> now notice very carefully the, the scripture says that brought him to the valley, not a valley. So he's talking about a specific location. He's not talking to a valley, uh, one of many valleys. He's talking about one specific location. Uh, this is known as the valley. So um, what valley could this be? Where is this? So if you look at what a valley is, a valley is, is the, the place between two mountain peaks. It, so this is at the foothill of a great mountain peak. And the Bible says that the Lord rests on a mountain and that mount is Mount Zion. So could this be the base of Mount Zion? I would think so. And, and for, for the purpose of this, and, and we'll unpack it in this, in this teaching, uh, I think you'll agree with me that this is possibly where that spiritual location is, not the literal location. This is at the, the base of Mount Zion because there is only one Mount Zion. So therefore there can only be one valley at the base of Mount Zion. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 21 says, but you have come to the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better of better things than of Abel. So, this speaks of a, of a specific location, this Mount Zion, the city of the living God, which we, knows, which we know is a spiritual location today. It's the place of the perfected church, the corporate body, the place where Christ, the head, will rest himself because he's looking to rest himself on a body. Now, in this valley, there are bones dry bones. Now, bones speak of the skeletal structure of all creatures. For bones to be present, it means that death has visited. What has it visited? It's visited the flesh. And it means that decomposition has been completed. And the only thing that we have left is this hard calcific structure that is left behind known as a bone. Now, you know that bones may never decompose. We have fossils of dinosaurs that people are still finding in layers of the crust of the earth. So if a bone is well preserved, it can last for a very long time. Now, in an open plain, if you were to look at a valley, um, a valley is an extremely lush and fruitful area. Um, it is, it's fresh and it's clean. You have this mountain air and this mountain water that is running through. It smells clean, it smells healthy, the, the ground is rich and fertile. Um, so that's what you would expect to see in a valley. I know that, that you've been taught that a valley is a picture of a descended position of someone who is down because it, it is below and the mountain is on the peak. But if you were to just look at it now from this perspective, a valley is actually... Uh, it's a place that you want to be. Uh, I spent a great number of years of my life in, in Pokhara Valley in Nepal. 
and it is the most beautiful place. You wake up and you see these beautiful mountains. Uh, you see the clouds descending. There's fresh water. The air is brisk and clean. It's, a, it's a rich. It's fertile. But in this place, you know, where, where we're saying that this is at the, the, the base of Mount Zion, we're finding bones. Only bones. Now, the best environment for fossilization of terrestrial animals is in the wetlands. That's in a valley. However, fossilization can only occur when there is an abundance of water and the absence of oxygen, which causes the decomposition. Now, if the bones were simply left to the elements, they would be destroyed. They would dry out and they would be destroyed. But water has preserved the bones. So now, what kept these bones dry? It's the presence of God. See, bones represent death, because if you see a bone, you know something has given up its life. But bones also represent structure. The reason I'm able to stand here is because there is a structure inside of me stronger than steel uh, that is this miraculous thing that man cannot scientists and 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 doctors can still not completely comprehend that is inside of me that is keeping me upright so bones also represent structure now god's structure has always been a man he created the heavens and the earth in order to house a structure of man. All of this around us, all this beautiful creation, the mountains, the trees, the birth, all of that was created to house this structure called man. And the purpose of man was to represent Christ on the earth. Creation is groaning for, the, for sons to manifest themselves. So, if you were to look at this carefully, you will, you will agree with me that this valley was a museum. And it lodged structures that were left behind and well preserved by the presence of God. And where are these structures located? They are located at the base of Mount Zion. The resting place. Of, of the Lord is on the peak of the mountain, but at the base of the mountain are these structures that he's preserved, waiting for an army to arise and come into it. So in this location called the valley, there are many old dry structures and these structures don't have flesh on it. These structures do not have the stench of decomposition. The flesh has long been destroyed, but a strong, hard structure is dead unless it can take on humanity. And this humanity is the exact manifestation of Christ. So these structures are here at the base of the mountain, but they remain dead until man can take on the structure, take it on in this form of, of being a spirit-filled living being and arise. Amen. Now, verse 2 says, Then he caused me to pass them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were all dry. So your first impression it's probably that this is a graveyard, okay? An open graveyard. But in an open graveyard, you would expect to see vultures and crows and other scavengers and the stench of decomposition. You would expect to find something that is unhealthy and disgusting. But to find bones open and dry and well-preserved, now, this is an impossibility because, like I said, it has to be well preserved with no oxygen and in water. So, so to have it out 
and about, to expose to the elements. Now, this is an impossibility. So, the bones can only remain dry if they have become fossilized through, this, through the sedimentation that is deep within the earth, but this has not happened. Something made these bones, uh, preserved these bones, and allowed just the flesh to die. Something allowed these bones to be, um, to be preserved in their proper integrity without any flesh. And this was the Spirit of God. He makes the flesh die and he preserves his structures. And then the Lord says to him, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, oh Lord, you know. Now just imagine this. Imagine the scene. Imagine how Ezekiel was feeling. Uh, he's, he's been brought out. He's broken out. He, he's in the spirit and he's seeing these things. But it's just not making sense. And then he hears the Lord. He hears the unction of the spirit says, Son of man, can these bones live? Look at what God is referring to him as. The son of man. Luke chapter 22 verse 69 says, Hereafter the son of man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. Now this is Jesus talking. And he's talking about his name, his identity, his purpose, his future. But God is referring to Ezekiel in the same name and the same reference as Jesus. Son of man means son of God. He's calling Ezekiel by the name of Jesus. Imagine that. How is this possible? You see, in the spirit form, Ezekiel is more like God than like a man. When God sees Ezekiel and the grace that is put inside of Ezekiel in the spirit, he is seeing the image of the son of man, which is Christ. So, these are the things that we cannot see in the naked eye, but God sees. Every time you want to beat yourself up about something, consider how God sees you. What does God see you as? Are you the son of man? Or are you just the son of your biological father? God sees this man as perfected. When you look at, at, at somebody that is delivering the word, you look at the leaders, you look at the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, uh, the, the pastors. When you look at your spiritual father, are you seeing them only in the flesh? Or do you see the structure that is being formed in them and being preserved in them? God sees that only. When you break forth out of the natural and come into the supernatural, that's all God sees. So when we come to Mount Zion, we are entering into a spiritual realm where God sees us as the image of Christ. But our purpose is not to be the image of Christ to God. Your purpose is not to be the image of Christ to God, but the image of Christ to all the world. So we cannot say, that we've arrived simply because God sees us as his image. Unless your brother can also discern that, we have not arrived. That's why you cannot live in a, li a life of isolation. That's why you cannot live uh, saying that I will just work out my salvation myself. I will stay at home. I will not contaminate myself with anybody else in the body. I will not be a part of any church. I'll just live my life. I've got my family. I've got what I need. I have a relationship with God. I pray with him. I'm, I'm being good. And God sees me. I'm the son of God. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. No, 
That is not our purpose. Our purpose is to showcase what's inside of us to the rest of the world because creation is growing, groaning for that. And you cannot do that if you are in isolation. Don't let what is happening now in this pandemic uh, with all of us in lockdown and in isolation, don't, don't believe that that is what the final church is going to look like. No, this is just a temporary thing when God is calling his church back to himself. This is the time for us to just work out ourselves and are we in the image of God? Because the time will come when God is going to release us and that image that's inside of us has to come forth. Um, so now Ezekiel says, I don't know. He says, God, only you know. Now, why did God ask him this? Did God not know the answer? No. God is not asking him this question because he doesn't know the answer. God asks him this question because he wants Ezekiel to contemplate, to think about the task at hand. He wants him to try and contemplate the complexity of what it would take to make dry bones live. He needed to rely on God, not himself, for this answer. And so he looks in it and he says, you know what, this is an impossibility. Because firstly, these bones shouldn't be dry and up on land. I don't know, Lord. I don't know if these old structures that are here at the base of the mountain, I don't know if they can come to life. You see, there's a structure that God has in mind, that he had in mind from before the foundations of the earth for his glory to fall in. And man over time has put aside all of these structures. They don't want the structures of God. They don't, they, they've come up with their own ideologies. And we looked at all of the different ideologies in, 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 the, in the series of Judges. No, man doesn't want the structure of God. Man doesn't want the, the, the mindset of God. Man wants to do things his own way based on rational thought, logic. Man wants to build capitalistically. Uh, man wants to build socially. Uh, man is all about humanism and secularism now. Yeah, that's what man is. We've taken on this modernism and postmodernism. Everybody's got some sort of ideology in their mind. So when you look at that and then you look at what is God's economic structure, what is God's structure for wealth and prosperity and, and blessing and health? And, and you know, God has, has, has a structure for all of that, education, health, all of these things that are in the world. God has his own plan and it's resting here, well preserved at Mount Zion, waiting to see if there's anybody that can put aside their own, let their flesh die. And then take on the structure and let the Lord rebuild them in a new image. So Ezekiel looks at it and he says, oh Lord, I don't know. Only you. Only you know. When we come into this location, we need to realize that we're coming into this place. And God wants us to put aside our old structures and take on his. This valley is lush. This valley is wonderful. This valley is a place where we can be fruitful and multiply. But you've got to see it in the supernatural. If you don't trust the, tr the structure of God uh, to be all that you need, you will not take it on. And why can't you trust it? Because you can't see it. And why can't you see it? Because you haven't broken forth out of the natural into the supernatural. You see, when you look at these structures, it looks like a graveyard. It looks like a dead thing. When, when we start talking about wealth creation in the kingdom, and we talk about the anti-capitalistic, and, and the kingdom is all about sowing and reaping. It's all about giving into your, into your father's hands, that the safest place for my money is in the hands of my spiritual father, is at the hands of the apostles and not in a bank. 
uh, that I give my my first fruit because I understand the principle of of uh, of the remnant and and a representative sample. So I give a little, and I know that if I give a little, that it, it's transposed into the rest, and the all is made is made holy. That I give my offerings because I know that the needs of the temple need to be met, the needs of community need to be met, and that I am the source, and that I am the resource, and God will pour more and more into me so that I can resource the kingdom. There's more than enough wealth in the earth. There's more than enough, enough wealth in your hands. Uh, the widow didn't know how much she would have in her hands and when, until she went and she borrowed those vessels and that oil never ran dry. You, you cannot even contemplate it. It looks like a dead thing. There's no way. How can you say that if I give 10% of my tithe that I will not go hungry? I, I need to pay my, my bills. This just doesn't make sense. You're talking about an old archaic system, Cindy. What are you talking about? But the Lord says that is the structure that I've preserved. And right now it's just lying there dead at Mount Zion. Who is going to put it on? So Ezekiel says, rightly so, Lord. Rightly, he says, yes, Lord, I don't know. You see, we don't know if the structure we put on will reflect God. But when we get to this place called the valley, whatever structure it is that we put on, and that structure is for the full fulfillment of our divine purpose, whatever structure we put on, it's got to be activated by the word of God. Amen. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to pick up again um, in the next video, in the next lesson on what happens next. So I pray that you just spend some time meditating on this and thinking about this, thinking about your structure, because your structure is your ideologies and your mindsets. Go and listen to the, the series on, on Deborah and, and Shamga and, you know, just what are the different types of ideologies in the world and every one of us has been tainted with an ideology all of these things need to be broken down and uh, we need to take on this new structure and and this is the point that we are leading into how does this apostolic prophetic mantle that was activated through deborah um, in the book of judges how does that bring absolute peace and overcome the realm of capitalism and and social and economic bondage in our life amen so uh, i bless you and um